Thanks everyone for joining us. I'm really excited to continue the program today at lunch. Um, and I just want to say, I'm Corinne Kistner, I'm the Director of Programs with NACDO. Honored to have you all here and really delighted to welcome you to lunch today. Um, it's so fantastic to see so many familiar and new faces here this week. Um, as someone mentioned earlier, there are more than 800 of you here today, um, people who care deeply about streets and transportation. And there are more than 120 different cities and transit agencies represented, represented at the conference. From Anchorage, Alaska to Wauwatosa, Wisconsin, um, 120 different cities. So please stand if you work for a city or a transit agency or any public agency at all, just be recognized. Cities, transit agencies, public agencies. Awesome. Um, a couple of announcements. I want to give a, a thank you and a shout out to Jeff Wood with Overhead Wire. Jeff is live streaming all of the plenaries um, and recording them so that you can listen to them on the Overhead Wire podcast in the future. So tell any of your friends who weren't able to make it to Chicago this week to go to uh, bit.ly slash NACTO17 um, where all the plenaries are being live streamed. Um, and I also want to announce one exciting demo happening here in Chicago. Um, we know that trucks are disproportionately responsible for bicyclist and pedestrian fatalities. And we know that there are very easily implementable, inexpensive equipment modifications that can save lives. So as part of Chicago's Vision Zero initiative, the city is using its purchasing power uh, to move the market to safer vehicles. So tomorrow from 11 to 2, visit the truck demo right outside the hotel, outside the front entrance, um, to see the equipment on different configurations of city vehicles. Uh, so next, I'd like to give a very warm thank you to Zipcar for sponsoring today's lunch. We really appreciate the support, and I'd like to invite uh, Zipcar President Tracy Ch Zen to say a few words. Thank you, Corinne. First, let me say on behalf of all the sponsors here, thank you to the team at NACTO for giving us this opportunity to support such a great gathering. Many of you have heard of Zipcar, and I hope many of you already have Zipcar in your cities. For 17 years, we've enabled our members to live simply and responsibly by providing access to a vehicle over owning one. What drives us at Zipcar is our social mission. Our belief in a world where one day car sharers will outnumber car owners. We believe that future isn't very far away, and thanks to you all. So I'm here to deliver a very simple message today, and that's to say thank you. For those of you that are Zipcar members, thank you for being part of our car sharing community. You as part of this community have reduced millions of carbon and taken away hundreds of thousands, the need for hundreds of thousands of cars off the roads. To those of you who are partner cities or transit agencies, thank you for working with us to accelerate a car light lifestyle and for making car sharing more accessible in your communities. And to those of you that are here today, we thank you for building and designing more sustainable, more responsible, more equitable and livable cities. Zipcar would not exist today without the vibrant ecosystem of mobility options anchored by good planning. As we think about the future of mobility, we believe it is driven by strong partnerships with you all. We have many exciting plans ahead and we look forward to working even more closely with you all to achieve them. Thank you for an opportunity to say a few words and again to the team at NACTO for organizing such a great event. Enjoy your lunch, and I'll hand over back to Corinne to introduce our keynote speaker. So at NACTA, we spend a lot of time imagining the future, talking about how streets are changeable, how we have to act now to redesign streets that put people first. We get very excited, and rightfully so, about possibilities for the future, about opportunities to imagine what might be different about this street or that public space. Uh, but this past year, I've found myself, and I think many of us have found ourselves, in a period of reflection. We've spent time studying history, looking to the past for lessons about the future, 
and looking to learn what we might do differently as old challenges present themselves in new ways. That's why I'm really excited to present, excited and very honored to present today's keynote speaker, Peter Norton. Peter is an associate professor of history in the Department of Engineering and Society at the University of Virginia. And his book, Fighting Traffic, The Dawn of the Motor Age in the American City, was on my required reading list when I first joined NACDO. Peter writes about people, cities, and cars, and about our evolving social norms for streets. And at this time, when we're very consciously reshaping our streets and asking each other how to do that, I'm delighted to welcome him to the NACDO stage to share his insights into the past and reflections on what that might mean for the future. Please join me in welcoming Peter Norton. Happy Halloween. I have a lavalier on, so is that coming through? No. Um, should I take the microphone? All right. I'm taking the microphone, uh, which is fine. Um, happy Halloween. It seems fitting for me to have a costume, so I'm making myself Robert Moses. Maybe some of you will find that scary. If you don't find that scary, maybe uh, this talk right now will help you. Uh, but I think um, fear can be a good motivator, so there's a, a cause or re good reason sometimes for a little bit of constructive fear, and we have uh, plenty of possibilities for constructive fear around us uh, right now. For example, I come to you from Charlottesville, Virginia, a town I used to have to explain to people where it is, and unfortunately I don't anymore. I'd like to suggest to you that um, the struggles we've had in Charlottesville and in other parts of America have to do with our future, but very much have to do with our past as well and with reckoning honestly with our past and with reckoning with versions of the past that are obstacles to the future uh, that we seek. I'd like to suggest to you that uh, there are abuse stories around us. You could see them being played out in Charlottesville. And I think there are an anal analogous abuse stories that cities have suffered from over the past century almost. Uh, every case of abuse has a story that justifies it, and that story is intrinsically historical in character. It is a justification for the power imbalance between the oppressor and the oppressed. And it's only by reckoning with that story from the past that we have a chance to uh, escape from the confines of the past and find um, the future we seek. So I want to start this talk with a little invocation or refrain or collect. Uh, use the term you prefer. You might take a look at that. So delicately interwoven are the relationships that when we disturb one thread of the community fabric, we alter it all. This statement was made about 60 years ago. I think most of you will recognize the speaker's name. I'm going to withhold the name for now in the hope that this might get you thinking a little bit about who might have said this and why it might have been said in, in the 1950s at a time we don't associate with this kind of sensitivity. I think this is a guiding principle that we have to adopt if we're going to change the trajectory of history that we have inherited and that is constraining to the futures um, that we seek. Here is a vision of the future, the city future. This comes from Continental Tire Company. It's autonomous cars delivering the automobile city that's been promised to us for the last 80 years. Finally, it's coming. Nobody has to walk anywhere anymore. These are the versions of the city future that are being created for our consumption. Uh, and there's many variations on it. Um, you, many of you will be acquainted with MIT driveway version, which suggests that uh, we can have a future where we will never have to stop our car at an intersection, which may make you wonder what you do if you're not in a car, which doesn't seem to have entered the imagination of the people designing this. You might say, well, an autonomous car will stop for a pedestrian, and that means that actually pedestrians win with autonomous cars. Maybe, maybe they will win with autonomous cars, but history teaches us that there are ways for the vehicle to fight back. There are ways for the vehicle to shame the pedestrian out of the street, and that might be a high-tech version 
of slurs that were used to get people off the street 80, 90 years ago. Maybe a car can issue those now in the form of a scary noise that will drive people off the street instead. A little acquaintance with history ought to make us less confident that because driverless cars will stop for pedestrians, that pedestrians will automatically win as a result. I want to go back in time. This is Chicago, State Street, 1925. What you're seeing here is a struggle between conflicting balances of power. Pedestrians who have the right to the street everywhere they're standing. None of those pedestrians is uh, violating any sort of city ordinance, but they're clearly in conflict with automobiles. They are officially, pedestrians are officially supposed to be in the street. That's the only means of accessing those street cars, which are kind of a pedestrian augmentation. Uh, and yet we have a conflict here, and it's this conflict that I think of as the transitional moment. Uh, I think of as the moment that we have inherited, a moment where we find ourselves as advocates for a more human, people-centered city uh, facing obstacles that make us, our, our hopes look illegitimate. These were the mainstream views of that time. Most people agree the streets are for children to play in. This is 1912, Chicago Tribune. Uh, this you might think of as the sort of uh, Chicago Tribune perspective. The ordinary Chicagoan's perspective was captured in letters to the editor, like this one, where James O. Millar says that pedestrians have pre preference in the street. Streets are not for automobiles. Uh, Millar thought he was stating the obvious. Everybody knew this at that time. Well, it's no longer so obvious, is it? Uh, we also have the official point of view. R.F. Kelker, R Rudolf Kelker, was the leading transportation expert in Chicago in the 1920s. He had a national reputation. He consulted with cities nationwide. And his perspective is quite interesting as well in 1922. He said, we let the pedestrians walk wherever they want. They can ignore the signals. The signals are not for them. We find that this slows up vehicles a little bit, but that's okay because this means we don't have any accidents because all the drivers have to be careful. This is shared space. This is streets for people in 1922. And I think it behooves us to ask how we lost this. I think it behooves us to ask how we reconcile this with versions of American history that tell us that all Americans embrace the automobile eagerly, which is in fact far from true. And there's a reason why we inherited that version of history. So the Yellow Cab Company was one of among several interest groups who was not at all happy with Kelker's shared space concept. They wanted streets for motor vehicles. They proposed traffic signals, red and green lights, that would be optimally timed for motor vehicles. They used a sort of software of the 20s, which is a slide rule. Those straight lines indicate where you get a continuous green wave. That is, you get a green light if you're going the right speed through every intersection there. This one happens to be for Cleveland, but the Chicagoans love this idea. They got the city to implement it in 1926. It's amazing that nobody seems to know that Chicago introduced the first coordinated traffic light system in the world. On February the 7th, the traffic lights of the Loop District were coordinated such that motorists going the right speed and finding a green light generally never had to stop as they drove through the whole district. Now, this was a great success from the motorist's standpoint. And we see rave reviews about vehicles racing through the Loop District without having to stop. Go at Jackson, go at Adams, go at Madison, go at Washington. They just keep going, and it's like a miracle to them. All right? It's just amazing. The police chief weighs in on this, too. And he says, actually, we do have one problem. It's the pedestrian. And I think you can actually see how pedestrians responded to this in a photograph taken that day, Tuesday, February the 9th, 1926. Uh, we see pedestrians wondering how in the heck they're ever going to cross the street when the lights keep, uh, the lights never give them a chance to cross. They're timed for motor vehicles. They can't cross the street between the blocks in the middle of the intersection because now the vehicles are never stopping. They were used to walking in the street wherever they wanted. Things are changing. We see this covered in the Chicago Tribune as well. Pedestrian problem is becoming acute. There are panic situations for them. And traffic is moving faster. Well, this is the distant ancestor 
of the interest in or, or the evaluation of traffic as fast vehicles. The faster, the better, uh, and pedestrians are just people who seem to be, you know, on their way to a vehicle rather than legitimate form of traffic themselves. Notice how even in 1926, the Chicago Tribune is implicitly excluding pedestrians from traffic, right? This is the predecessor of this. This is, in other words, the same kind of values that are being measured. Values were lost uh, with this transition, and it's, we're struggling now to recover them. Values, essentially any value besides moving vehicles quickly and safely without regard for other values in the street. I suggest to you that this is a kind of salesmanship. This is a Chicago advertisement for wizard oil that cu cures everything. The autonomous vehicle may indeed be a fantastic tool, but it's sometimes sold as if it's a panacea, just like wizard oil was. Another contemporary reference with the early 20th century is with The Wizard of Oz. This is from the original book. The Wizard of Oz was actually a fraud. The Wizard of Oz was an illusionist. The Wizard of Oz was really the Wizard of Omaha, which is not quite as exciting as Oz. And uh, the Wizard of Omaha practiced upon the credulity and the naivete of the people who visited him. And this is, uh, in part, how we have inherited these strange values about what constitutes good urban traffic. We, all of us, as Corinne said, are interested in the future, right? The future, of course, is on a trajectory. It's on a trajectory with the status quo. I ran across an interesting statement. Nothing truer has ever been said about the status quo. This was a statement made in March 2017 by Corinne. I can recommend this podcast to you, uh, where uh, Corinne actually very, to my mind, astutely captures the framing problem that we have inherited, and that explains, it is history that explains why we have this entrenched status quo. All right, now we know that motordom, as the automobile interests used to call themselves, I think it's a useful term, because it captures much more than just manufacturers, uh, they actually shifted this trajectory of history in the past. They shifted it in the 1920s. The good news for us is that means if it could be shifted once, it can be shifted again. And the fact that streets can change, I understand, to be one of the essential guiding principles of NACTO. And I commend you all for recognizing that because not everybody does. So we are interested now in a if future one is the automobile city. Future two would be something a little different. Automobiles, autonomous or not, certainly would have a place as a tool, but only as a tool. And I think we have to ask ourselves, how do we shift trajectory's history? I'm sorry, history's trajectory. There is an expert on this. He's a teacher to me. Uh, he's from an earlier generation, so I never got to meet him personally, but I consider him a mentor. His name is Carter Woodson. Carter Woodson was interested in shifting the trajectory of history. Uh, when he started to work on this in 1915, Hollywood had just put out Birth of a Nation, uh, you know, this, the, the feature-length movie that made the Ku Klux Klan into the heroes. He and his associates wanted a different future. His associates all talked about the future they wanted, and Carter Woodson would tell them, you're wasting your time, because until we reckon with the past that justifies this future uh, that we're currently on a path toward, of racial supremacy and segregation, we will never overcome it. History is the justification for that future we dread. We have to go back to history and recover the rewritten stories. Uh, Woodson used a term I use frequently myself. He called the people who wrote the history that justified segregation, justified white supremacy. Uh, he called those people the rewriters of history. Indeed they were, they were good at it, they wrote what appeared to be serious, credible, scholarly works, all of which had the same thesis. The thesis was that African Americans were incapable of self-government, and it was a travesty for the North to put them in charge of the Southern states' governments after the Civil War, uh, and we need to correct this, and we correct it through the monuments we've been dealing with today, the monuments that literally cast a shadow on my children's school in Charlottesville, uh, but it's more than just monuments whose shadows are cast over us. We also have inherited a version of history that justifies automobile supremacy in American cities. 
that's a version of history we haven't seriously uh, deconstructed. It was deliberately constructed quite cleverly, quite well. It's not entirely deceptive by any means, but a history that tells us that we Americans love cars so much we're willing to destroy every city block in them just to park them. All right. So Woodson's message was, if you want future to, you're going to have to recover past to. You're going to have to go back to the primary sources, forget about the experts whose agendas were serving the people who were interested in the, in the status quo, go back and find the original documents, the primary sources, I teach my students this, it's a delight incidentally for me to have a former student of mine in this room right now. Um, here is a couple of glimpses, I don't have time for more, of past two, in other words, of the past you get if you go directly there. This is Rochester, about 1900. Uh, you notice that there are vehicles, they are streetcars predominantly, those I consider to be adjuncts to pedestrians. They help pedestrians, they're, they're sort of an augmented pedestrianism. There are also a few other vehicles as well. People are walking wherever they want. There are even bicycles everywhere. Look at these bicycle racks. Every red circle there surrounds a crowded, packed bicycle rack. This is a version of history we don't hear a lot about. The things that we think of, we're very pleased with ourselves for certain recent innovations, like the fact that most city buses now let you put a bike on them. That's actually a very old idea. This is Sacramento, California. You could put your bike on the streetcar. They had a rack for it. This is over 100 years ago. You could get your bike on a streetcar. I want to suggest to you that as flawed as, uh, as the legacies of our history are, there's a lot we can learn from it, and this is um, a case in point, I would say. So back to State Street, 1925, when we mix motor vehicles uh, with their capacity for speed and, and for cutting corners and so on, into this mix where pedestrians have both the legal right and social norms justify this right uh, to access the street anywhere they please at any time, uh, it was almost impossible to be guilty of contributory ne negligence as a pedestrian in those days. Um, we have a dangerous mix. It's a mix best captured perhaps in these data, where you see 15,000 people a year being killed in 1923, even though only a minority of Americans own an automobile. In cities, the character of these casualties is distinctive. Three quarters were pedestrians, of the deaths were pedestrians in Philadelphia. And of the people getting hit by cars, uh, a disproportionate share were children. Today we are trained to ask, what was wrong with the parent? Where did the parent, you know, who let this child outside of their locked house? Who let the child outside of their vehicle? Uh, but the, the way this was framed, and uh, again I commend Corin for recognizing that it's framing that we are up against, the way this was framed in the 1920s was radically different. Here's the New York Times depicting the problem as the motor vehicle and its driver. Notice how its victims on the street there are all in the middle of the street, which where we would say, oh yeah, well, of course, you know, they kind of had it coming. But in 1924, the New York Times depicts them in the street, and nevertheless, it is the motor vehicle that is to blame. This is a scary message to motordom, that is the business interests who are interested in a future for cars in cities. These are the sort of typical cartoons of the time. Again, the victims are in the street, and yet they are considered innocent in these mainstream depictions of that era. We even have proposals, like in Cincinnati, where it went further than anywhere else, for laws requiring cars to be equipped with mechanical speed governors that would make it impossible for them to go more than 25 miles an hour. These were widespread proposals. They terrified people who wanted a future market for cars and cities. They organized. They organized very effectively. Um, we can see uh, in this particular case in Cincinnati, they answered ad or advertisements like this in the Cincinnati Inquirer. This one was about an inch tall with full page ads like this one where they say, you know, you're dooming your city if you have uh, this ordinance uh, in place. To motordom, this meant you were going to have to reframe, redefine safe, the issue of safety, as these headlines from motordom trade journals indicate. It was not just safety, though, that mobilized motordom in the 20s. They were also concerned with the fact that experts and ordinary people alike agreed that it was fairly common sense that cars don't really fit in cities, right? They're sort of spatially inefficient. 
And this spatial inefficiency means that while cars will always have a place in rural America, suburban America, uh, their place within the city is going to be uh, more limited. Motordom decided this was actually an idea that had to be changed. You can see that in statements like this one from Edward S. Jordan of the Jordan Motor Car Company, uh, who was saying to his industry colleagues that this problem of traffic congestion in cities is going to limit our urban market. And the solution is not for people in cities to get around by more spatially efficient modes. The solution is to supply vastly more road capacity. You see this idea really taking off in the mid-1920s, uh, with Jordan quickly finding a lot of good companionship with it for this cause within motordom. Engineering News Record probably spotted the significant point most astutely. These are the people who build the highways. They wanted to build highways in cities as well. And they said in 1922, the obvious solution lies only in a radical revision of our conception of what a city street is for. A breathtaking statement. It's, I think the breathtakingness of this statement is magnified by the fact that this revision was substantially, or I almost would say overwhelmingly, successful. The good news of the success of this radical revision, notice they're calling themselves radical here. They recognize that the mainstream is against them on this. Right? They are the radicals and they, they embrace the name. This is for an internal audience of, uh, this is a trade journal. Uh, the good news, of course, is if these radical revisions can happen successfully once, they can happen again, and I know that NACTO has a commitment to the possibility of the redefinition of what streets are for, and I think there's a lot to be learned from the success in this case. How do you do it? Well, I don't have time to tell you all the techniques, Probably the, the one that seems to have attracted the most interest is in inventing the concept of jaywalking and shaming people. Because let's be clear, this technique was used and introduced at a time when the right of a pedestrian to the street was unquestioned by judges, by juries, by police, by mainstream newspapers, uh, by conventional social norms. This is what streets were for. Uh, I would love to quote from you letter to the editor after letter to the editor where people are just sort of amazed that anybody is questioning the right of a pedestrian to stride anywhere into the street they, that they please with due consideration for the convenience and safety of others, obviously, but not with some kind of constraint like, like this one. These cards were handed out in dozens of American cities, usually by Boy Scouts working for free, free labor, and uh, people who got these cards very often had no idea what jaywalking was. We know that from the newspaper coverage of the time. This is how people learned. This technique was so successful that by 1924, the word was actually in the dictionary uh, for the first time ever. This is one of a great many techniques. Of course, you have to reach the children too, and if you can reach the children, you're reaching the future. Uh, you can find this in many examples. Here's uh, one of my favorites. This is a coloring book. Now, imagination was not celebrated as much in the 20s as it is today. You were supposed to look at the top picture, figure out what the color of the car was, and then you know, get out your yellow crayon and dutifully color the car yellow. Every time your eye passed over the text in the middle, you saw this. That's a wonderfully ingenious technique to work in this very important message to redefine streets. Now let's be clear, it's probably good that by the time they were getting these cartoons that this message was getting out there because the streets really were getting deadly. But this does presuppose, of course, that the solution to that danger problem is to deprive children of their access to streets, a problem that, of course, has just continued to extraordinary degrees such that uh, we know that the uh, maximum range of the typical child today is a fraction of what it used to be. So we're talking about shifting the, the uh, trajectory of history. One of the ways to shift that trajectory is to promise a future, uh, particularly a utopian future, that can never actually be reached, but sort of dangle it in front of people as an inducement to accept the costs of this massive shift of trajectory. There was a genius behind this promise of unreachable utopias. And I, I, I think reading between the lines of his text, it was quite clear he knew these were unachievable, and that was actually sort of the beauty of it. If it's unachievable, you can lead people along forever, right? Well, the uh, innovator of this idea was Charles Kettering of General Motors, uh, an all-around genius, uh, you know, spark plugs, 
uh, lead and gasoline for a higher compression ratio engine with some other unfortunate consequences, but also uh, a, psych a psychological uh, genius. He recognized, like Carter Woodson did, that the trajectory of history can indeed be shifted. It's a matter of knowing how. His favorite technique was to promise a utopian future. Uh, you, in, the, the secret is to keep the consumer dissatisfied. This is his headline in Nation's Business Magazine, 1929. He's saying to his friends in the auto industry, you, you guys got to stop giving the customers everything they want because then they buy it, they're happy with it, and they never come back. All right? That's not how you sell cars. How do you sell cars? You sort of constantly promise them something better, keep them permanently dissatisfied. This is, of course, consumerism. Kettering didn't invent this technique. You can see it, you know, Listerine uh, invented the concept that you should be worried if you didn't rinse your mouth with this, this stuff every single morning, uh, because if you didn't, people are going to ostracize you. <laughs> and the real genius of this ad is you can't know if you have halitosis. People are too nice to tell you if you have it. And therefore, you're just going to have to rinse your mouth out every day. Now, until this moment, Listerine was sold only as a antiseptic for open wounds. What an incredibly small market. Now it's for everybody who doesn't want to be ostracized. That's a bigger market, right? This is, of course, uh, Kettering. Kettering took this idea, applied it to General Motors. He gave it, it one of the manifestations of the annual model change. I think you're acquainted with that. Also with the General Motors Ladder of Success, really, that's the name. You start off with a Chevrolet. Long before it's worn out, while it's still working, you're supposed to be dissatisfied. Remember, keep the consumer dissatisfied because, you know, your neighbor has a Pontiac, you know, and then eventually the, you can get the Oldsmobile and then the Buick. Uh, and finally, you know, you've really arrived someplace when you have uh, the Cadillac, all right? So this is sort of a, a kind of unwinnable war for social acceptance, except there is, of course, a winner, and that is, uh, in this case, uh, General Motors. Now, how do you apply this concept for selling individual cars to selling the automobile city? Well, you can do it, too. Kettering was one of the pioneers of this. You can promise that in the city of the future, you will never have to go slower than 50 miles an hour, ever. There will be no traffic lights. There will be no pedestrians in your way. You can drive everywhere you want. And it's going to be a beautiful city. Don't think it's just going to be parking lots and highways. And you can promise that, of course, because you don't actually have to show the results. You're just promising this future. And in the pursuit of this unachievable utopia, the city where you can drive anywhere at any time without delay and park for free when you get there, that city, of course, is unachievable. But in pursuing that city, at least it's unachievable with any result that's consistent with any recognizable uh, definition of the word city, should, maybe should put it that way. Um, it's, the, it's not the goal itself that you're after if you want to sell the automobile city, it's the pursuit of it. The pursuit of it solves that problem that Edward S. Jordan said, that there's just not enough room for cars and that's limiting our market. You know how this played out most famously, I think, at the uh, Futurama exhibit at the General Motors um, General Motors exhibit at the uh, New York World's Fair of 1939 to 40. Millions were exposed to this in one way or another. Uh, it was not only visited by millions personally, it was made into a film. Uh, components of it toured the country. This is promising people a future that's so attractive that people will be willing to suffer certain losses, like, for example, maybe their neighborhoods, uh, in return for it. it. And again, it works because it, is, it doesn't have to actually be practical. These cars actually moved in the model. The model was enormous. The cars moved in little slots. And the car, when it got to the end of the model road, didn't have to park anywhere. It just went under the road and went back to the beginning on this continuous belt. And so you got the illusion of a future city where everybody could drive everywhere and no, there, there was no need for parking. You don't need that, all right? And I would say this is not unlike, to, to return to the Wizard of Oz, this is not unlike the idea of the yellow brick road. You're going to an illusion city. The Emerald City, particularly in the book more than in the movie, is a city of illusions. I wish, it's, it's significant, I think, that Futurama and the Wizard of Oz movie are both 1939. Uh, you, both you, you see this sort of utopianism in, in the atmosphere at this time, manifesting in various ways around the world. And uh, here you see uh, the yellow brick road. In other words, they're promising these travelers who are naive and represented as such, who have a lot to learn about what they already had. Remember, there's no place like home. What they already had 
but we're abandoning for the sake of this illusion. In pursuing the illusion, you give up something too. And these tr naive travelers don't know yet what they're giving up. They're going to learn, as I think you all know. I don't think that's a spoiler. Uh, <laughs> this is, of course, a Futurama exhibit. And I think the Futurama exhibit is a kind of, it's, it's a world of illusions as well. It doesn't really work. The model doesn't really add up when you look at it from an engineering perspective. And it's not really supposed to uh, add up either. So shifting trajectories of history means not just offering a future that's attractive. It also means shifting to a past that legitimizes or justifies this new trajectory of history. Uh, Kettering was a genius at this as well. Uh, I, I don't, uh, people don't seem to know that most of what we think we know about the history of the automobile in the USA was written for us by people who want to sell cars. I'm talking about the stuff that really got wide readership, high visibility in various forms. Kettering himself personally co-authored a book that called The Car the New Necessity. This was a history of the automobile that justified uh, the car. He also organized a traveling road show following the 1933 World's Fair in Chicago, uh, where people could watch an amazing electromechanical diorama that changed before your eyes that shows automobiles delivering this little town from misery and poverty into all things good. And people watch it and sort of recognize that this is uh, an attractive future. It certainly was represented in a very attractive way indeed. Now, by the 1950s, though, the extent of this reconstruction is leading to a lot of controversy. I think you're acquainted with uh, most of these books. Uh, these appeared, these really proliferated. Uh, we've forgotten the extent of this proliferation following the Interstate Highway Act of 1956 when we really start to see some major urban destruction for the sake of the car going on. There's a lot of criticism of this. This re criticism required an answer. The answer appeared most eloquently in 1961 on TV in the form of an hour-long primetime documentary on the DuPont Show of the Week. At that time, DuPont had a 23% share of General Motors. And the DuPont Show of the Week explained the history of the automobile as told by Groucho Marx as, and this was it, the term they used, it was America's love affair with the automobile. This is where the phrase began. People think that this is folk wisdom. They don't realize that this is an ingenious public relations move. Why? Because if it's a love affair, you never have to justify it to anybody. Love is blind. Love will find a way. And the, 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 sort, of, the sort of thesis of this program is, you experts at NACTO, you guys have your data and stuff like this, but you don't understand love. And that makes you, <laughs> you know. And, and I think it's time, you know, we have came up with some sort of answer and maybe some sort of love affair of, with the street is in, in order. This is not just 1961. If you go to Washington, D.C. today, you will see at pat taxpayer expense this exhibit in the General Motors Hall of, Fa uh, General Motors Hall of Transportation. Uh, they, got, they, they paid $10 million to get this name. And this is the love affair with the automobile told for the audiences of 2017. It's a little more nuanced, but it is still the same message as I could explain. So uh, we have these depictions of a future city. No problem with parking lots. Everybody can drive into. You've got to wonder where all these people are going to park. Uh, they're not really going to deal with that in these depictions. But it is a city uh, which is an application of a concept of mastery rather than balance, right? Um, I think you can see that in the same era with the marketing of DDT. This is mastery over, kill them all, right? This is not unlike the conventional traffic engineering that says, you know, we will keep adding lanes until there is no more congestion, right? Or no more city, whichever comes first. We will just keep adding lanes. This is, this is the same mentality. In other words, we're not talking about balance. We're not talking about those relationships I quoted in that opening quotation. We're talking about mastery, triumph, prevailing. Uh, it's an unwinnable war. Uh, it's supposed to save you money because it will eliminate delay. But it's, it's amazing to me that you still see organizations, um, forgive me if anyone's offended, Texas Transportation Institute, for example, is constantly talking about delay as if, you know, it actually makes sense to pursue a future where if you choose to drive a car, you will never be slowed down. Quite kind of an amazing agenda, but they come up with a dollar value for the car driver's time. 
that seems to justify this. But I want to know why these people waiting at a red light, why is that not delay? You know, why, maybe we should start calling this delay too and make the, you know, give that a dollar value, right? So we're talking now about cures, cures for congestion, not, not like balances or anything of the kind. They are looking for a cure. I think this medical analogy is kind of interesting. It's still with us. American Highway Users Alliance talks about unclogging our arteries. This is supposed to justify unlimited expenditures. Uh, and I think this is not unlike trying to promise people that they will have no pain. And the beauty of it is, although you will never actually deliver people from pain with opioids or anything else in any kind of final way, you will create a permanent market for your pharmaceutical in the effort. So actually not succeeding is kind of a kind of success, paradoxically, you might say. Uh, American Society of Civil Engineers, ostensibly a professional society, says we can cure this for $3.6 trillion. Sounds good to me. 3.6 trillion, maybe we can come up with it in this room, I don't know. That's, uh, that's how we will cure, uh, I stress on the word cure, uh, these problems. But I want to ask what happens to a city when you try to cure congestion in a way that doesn't constrain automobility? Well, we don't have to ask in the abstract, we can see. We can see what happens, in other words, when you violate this precept that I quoted at the beginning of this talk. This is Hastings Street, Detroit. Uh, the people here are generally getting around just fine, but if you can redefine this African-American neighborhood as a blighted slum district, then you can get urban renewal funds from the federal government that will relocate people, uh, uh, theoretically, uh, from their homes so that you can put in the Chrysler Freeway. This is the same view, all right? I'll put them side by side. Left and right, same view, Chrysler Freeway on the, on the right, you should be wondering not only how did this crime against humanity happen, but also where are all these suburbanites going to park, right? Which is why Detroit is actually, at least downtown Detroit, is not actually a city. It is a parking lot. All that is parking in central Detroit. It's the only way you can fit in all those cars coming in on all those freeways, which is great if actually you think selling cars is a, is a really good idea. It doesn't jibe with these depictions like Firestones of the uh, automobile city of the future. This is St. Paul, Minnesota, Rondo Avenue, the African-American neighborhood of Rondo. Um, this is it before I-94 came in, and this is I-94 on the same spot. You gotta wonder, how do we explain this kind of madness, right? This is the sterilized depiction. Here's what actually happens. This is New Haven, Connecticut, before the Oak Street connector. There's the Oak Street connector. Uh, they pulled this off by redefining the African-American neighborhood of New Haven as a slum. This, this opened up the federal money for urban renewal, and they put this thing in. And they, and they had a kind of answer to their critics. They said, well, look, there's federal money we can get for this. Why wouldn't we do it? Right. This is the kind of non-city that you get. This is in northern Virginia, uh, just as an illustration. So somebody back at that time, I'm talking 1961, asked this question. Well, I am a future historian from that person's perspective. It was Rachel Carson. She asked this in Silent Spring. She was asking about DDT, but I think she could easily have asked this about traffic. For example, take this line, the chemical war is never won. Well, we could say the same thing about the traffic war or the congestion war. Although it's never won, there are indeed losers, uh, people who are just trying to get around, right, by sustainable mobility methods, if we want to re rename walking. Right? Um, also, uh, there's also, um, besides the fact that there are losers of this unwinnable war, there are in fact winners as well. They are the people who are selling you all of this stuff, right? The pavers, the, et cetera, right? This is a warning that was offered to us by a five-star Republican general president named Dwight D. Eisenhower. You know his farewell address, he said, Let's uh, you, be careful because you know, this unwinnable war called the Cold War is creating a military industrial complex that we're losing control of. Well, the unwinnable war on congestion is analogous. I think there's something to be learned from the experts on anti-colonialism. You know, perhaps Franz Fanon, uh, he wrote a number of books, one of which was called Black Skin, White Masks. I think there's an analogy to that for cities, where cities have a sort, of, a sort of urban people with suburban masks. We put a suburban mask on the city. There might be something to learn from another anti-colonial expert named Steve Biko, who paid for his life for his anti-colonial work. Uh, he said the most powerful weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. He also said you won't be free until you define yourself 
in your own terms rather than by the terms the oppressor puts upon you as the measure of you. The terms, those terms we have in various forms. For traffic, we have them in these forms. These are essentially suburban standards imposed on cities, and cities are judged as failures because they fail to comply with suburban standards. Well, these standards are highly political things. You may know that the, you know, we, if you grew up in the USA like I did, we drank way too much milk. That is because the dairy industry made sure that we were expected to drink a lot of milk for our health. Well, we can redefine standards too. NACTO is doing that with these new manuals, right? Um, we can redefine them in such a way that this is not an ideal street, right? Uh, or this, these have been with us for a long time, these visions, uh, and they are still with us today. We have consultancies like KPMG promising the automobile city will finally be delivered with an uh, autonomous vehicle, which will, the auto industry will win because they will actually be able to sell you even more cars because they want you to keep the individual private ownership model. They offer to do it, and I am quoting now through the sexy dynamic experience. I have no idea what that means, but it's supposed to mean that your car will be like your phone. You don't want other people using it. This is how they intend to preserve the individual ownership model for the car. And they forecast that if that succeeds, the average occupancy rate of a motor vehicle will be less than one because they'll be driving around alone going back home. And that will be a win from their point of view because we will have sold one trillion miles of more mobility. Well, if you've read the original Wizard of Oz book, it's a world of illusions. The Emerald City is not made of emeralds. It's white plaster. It looks like emeralds because Dorothy and her companions have to wear green glasses. If you take the green glasses off, you can see uh, the world as it is. And I think that that makes um, a, a fitting closing point because, in fact, the, the statement that I've been quoting to you a couple of times over the course of this talk is Rachel Carson's own words, which I take to be guidance toward the sustainable mobility future we all seek together. Thank you very much.